You boys be quiet down there! Welcome back to PC88 Paradise. This video is going to be a follow-up to my previous one on the first Legend of Heroes, so you may want to watch that one first if you haven't already. The first thing that should be emphasized about Dragon Slayer The Legend of Heroes 2 is how much time had passed since the release of the first game. A gap of just over two years may not seem like too much. To me a game released in 2018 versus 2021 may not seem too different. But in the world of classic gaming, the difference between 1989 and 1992 is eons and eons of progress in game design and technology. By the time the second game was released, Falcom had already mostly moved on from the PC-88 in favor of its successor, the PC-98. In fact, this game was to become Falcom's final PC-88 title. So for the fans in the early 90s who stubbornly held on to their 8-bit PCs without upgrading, Falcon delivered one last hurrah on the platform where they had first risen to fame. So let's get right to it. The first thing I want to point out is the cover art. If you look at the previous Falcom games I've covered so far in this series, I might be inclined to say that they look kind of boring. This game was released in a different age, when Falcom started placing a larger emphasis on their characters and artwork. On the back side you'll see even more full color illustrations of the characters. Opening it up now you'll see the original Falcom seal from the outside of the case that has been preserved here on the inside by the previous owner. Like the first game there really is a lot of stuff in here. First we have the warranty and registration card. Next, we have an advertisement for a storybook based on Brandish. The backside of this shows other RPG-related books from the same publisher. Next, we have an advertisement for the Falcom Shop. This was a brick-and-mortar store that existed in Yoyogi from 1989 to 1998. I would have loved to be able to visit there, but it closed before I ever came to Japan. I guess the closest I'll ever come is the Falcom Museum that was briefly opened in 2017, which also had lots of stuff for sale. The back side of this shows a number of Falcom goods, which were no doubt available for purchase at the Falcom shop at the time. Next we have another large packet of brochures, so let's go through these quickly. Falcom Music CDs, Ease 3, Dinosaur, Novels based on Sorcerian, the first Legend of Heroes game, Lord Monarch, Popful Mail, and Brandish. Okay, let's see what else is in here. Next we have floppy disk stickers. Looks like the previous owner decided to use one of these. According to the explanation written here, the missing bottom sticker is for a user disk, and the stickers remaining at the top are intended for a disk sleeve. Next we have something very useful. This is not only a world map, but serves as a handy reference card that I always make sure to have in front of me while playing the game. The bottom section shows what all the function keys do, and on the back we have a complete list of equipment, items, and most importantly, spells. Next we come to the beautiful full color manual, filled with illustrations of not only the game characters and story, but even each item and piece of equipment. Finally, inside this case we have nine floppy disks. These consist of the boot disk, two event disks, four scenario disks, and two program disks. As I'll explain in a sec, these two disks are actually just the same thing, so it would be more accurate to say that the game spans eight floppies, not nine. Nevertheless, this is a pretty large number of disks for a PC-88 game. And since we're on the subject of floppies, let's talk about starting the game. This cute manga in the manual explains how. Unlike the first game, this game has a single boot disc which needs to be used every time you turn on the game, so let's do that now. We are taken to the main menu of the game. This boot disc simplifies things, but is actually kind of inconvenient in my opinion. You're just going to have to change discs again right away no matter what you choose here. It would be faster if you could continue the game by booting the program disc with whichever scenario disc you're currently working on, like in the first game. Interestingly though, this game gives you a choice of two different methods to save your game, both of which differ from the first game. The first method is using the program disc to save. The advantage here is that you don't need to do any disc swapping when you save, 
but the disadvantage is that you get only 10 save slots to use for your entire adventure. The original program disk comes with write protection disabled, so that save data can be written. But the danger here is that the player might accidentally corrupt the data on the disk or format over it or something, rendering the game unplayable. That's why they included a master program disk, which has write protection enabled. You can select the third option in the menu, Backup Program Disk, and use the master disk to create a fresh copy on a blank disk anytime. The other method to save your game is the fourth option in the menu, Create User Disk. You'll need to provide your own blank disk here. Luckily, the previous owner of my game was kind enough to include one. Hey, that's where my sticker went! The disadvantage to this method is that you need to switch disks every time you save your game, but the advantage is that you get a total of 400 slots for game saves. So take that, early PC-88 games that only allowed one save per user disk. This is the method I chose to use during my first playthrough of the game, and I used a total of 103 slots while staggering my saves throughout the game. Well, I think it's about time we start the adventure. The game asks us to insert Event Disk 1 in Drive 2. First we get the opening sequence. The music here is basically the same tune as the opening of the first game. I'll talk about the events the text is describing here later. The next part of the opening sequence is quite cinematic. Or about as cinematic as anything could be on an 8-bit computer anyway. It starts with a first-person view approaching a light at the end of a tunnel. Then we see some astronauts as they emerge from a cave, only to be immediately spotted by bandits who figure them for easy prey. As a dragon watches from above, the scene comes to a bloody end. That dripping blood effect looks so good for the PC-88. At this point, the meaning of this opening is not explained to the player. But don't worry, I'll tell you all about it in the spoiler section later. Okay, well that was a nice opening, let's start the- Oh wow, I wasn't ready for that. What can I say about this other than that it's awesome? It was an unwritten rule that Falcom opening sequences in the early 90s had to start with a boring text-based opening that you had to watch before you got to the exciting part with cool pixel art and rocking music. This is my kind of stuff. It reminds me of the openings for the Brandish games for PC-98. This to me is peak Falcom. So after the opening is over, we're asked to insert the program disc in Scenario Disc 1, which are the discs required to play the actual game. In Legend of Heroes 2, you take the role of Prince Atlas, who is the son of Serios, the protagonist of the first game, and his queen, Dina. Atlas has grown to take after his father, often sneaking out to hunt slimes. Since the events of the first game, the world of Iselhasa has seen an age of unprecedented peace, but peace still can't stop natural disasters from occurring. Just before Atlas's 16th birthday, the entire world of Iselhasa is rocked by a giant earthquake. King Serios decides that since Atlas is such a rambunctious young lad, that this would be a good opportunity for Atlas to take his first journey around the world. It will allow him to check up on each region in the aftermath of the earthquake. And besides, visiting every town in the world will allow him to use his warp wings to travel to each of them in the future, just like his father now can after his travels in the first game. Yeah, that's a good reason to send your son on a trip around the world on his own. Warp wings. Think about it. So off you go on a casual stroll around the world of the first game, encountering weak enemies that pose no real threat, especially since you are already given some of the best equipment in the game. The world and towns are laid out almost exactly the same as before, and you'll even encounter some of the old characters. 
Some players might be disappointed that the game uses the same engine and looks so much like the first, despite how much newer it is. But on the other hand, you can't really make graphics that look much better than this on the PC-88 anyway. So it's looking like this game is going to be basically just a rehash of the first. But this turns out to be one of the biggest fakeouts in gaming history. But before we get to any big reveals, there are also a few differences we can immediately see between this game and the first. For one thing, random battles have now been completely done away with. Enemies are visible on the map at all times. Secondly, there are a few animations added to the battles, making them a bit more fun to watch. Thirdly, the way your MP works has been changed to something more unique and interesting than the previous standard numerical system. You can assign any spell anywhere in any character's spell list, just like before, but here each spot in the list acts as one magic slot. You can use each spell in each slot once. Each used slot then slowly recharges automatically whenever you're not in battle. Because of this system, there are hardly any inns or beds in the game to stay the night, since they aren't necessary. When you get to a town, you use your healing magic to get everyone back to max HP, then just wait for all your slots to recharge. You might even find some safe spots in the dungeons where you can do this as well. Another nice improvement to the magic system is that instead of having spell levels like heal 1, heal 2, etc, there is only one version of each spell that becomes gradually more effective depending on the character's magic ability, a new stat added for this game. Overall, I like this new system. Can't have a new game without new characters. This game has only four characters who can join your party, unlike the five in the first game. Then again, Ro was just kind of a joke character who's only in your party for a short time near the beginning. The first character who joins Atlas is Rando, or maybe it's Lando, there's no English version of the game so I guess we'll never know. He's a wizard who is dedicated to mastering spells, but also hates the stereotype that magic users are physically weak. As you can guess from his physique, he's a formidable attacker as well. Like in the first game, any character can use any equipment, so I usually equip him with a sword. Why is he holding a staff in the illustration? Anyway, he meets Atlas quite randomly early in his quest. Hey, maybe his name really is Rando. Next is Flora, another magic user. She's the daughter of a rich family who is a bit naive and not well versed in the ways of the world. She has a kind heart and is dedicated to helping others, especially through healing magic. She also seems to have some psychic abilities and frequently has premonitions in her sleep of Freya, the goddess of this world, which is actually what prompts her to join Atlas's journey. Lastly, we have Cindy. Yes, Cindy. The other characters point out that Cindy is a girl's name when they first meet him, but come to think that the name oddly suits him due to his cute and gentle demeanor. Cindy is a mysterious masked character with amnesia who can't remember anything but his name. He's sort of a Hulk-like character with weak magic ability who speaks only in broken sentences. He joins the quest because Atlas's face reminds him of someone he remembers. The characters feel a lot more fleshed out than in the first game. Their dialogue feels a bit punchier and more entertaining. Sure, the first game did have some playful banter as well, but there is more here and it just feels more modern and better written. And while the first game had illustrations of the characters only in the opening and ending, this game has cutscenes between each chapter of the game, which goes a long way in bringing the story and characters to life. Next, most importantly, let's talk about the music. I love the music in this game. In the TurboGrafx community back in the 90s, I can remember there was always sort of a debate over whether the first or second game had better music. I was one of the few who held the opinion that the second is better. But on the PC-88, it's no contest. This game uses the pc 88 Soundboard 2, a newer FM soundboard with stereo sound and additional sound channels. So now, reviewing my sixth game for PC-88, I've finally come to a game that uses the soundboard too. Some of my favorite tracks include the opening and the end credits BGM, but almost everything here is great. There are a total of 29 tracks compared to the first game's puny 18, and I personally think the composition is just overall more interesting in the second game. 
the track which has gotten the most playtime over the years by Falcom themselves is a boss BGM called Stopper, which was remixed and included as a stage theme in Falcom's fighting game on the PSP, and has even been performed by the JDK band on occasion. And once again, you can use the CD-ROM drive for the music if you want. So you can use the special arranged version disc of Perfect Collection Dragon Slayer, The Legend of Heroes 2. Or, why not use the disc for the PC Engine game? This is the best arrangement of the soundtrack, in my opinion. Or you can literally use anything you want. The prelude section of the game actually lasts quite a while before we get to chapter 1. As I mentioned earlier, there is no challenge here in the battles, but one of the game's biggest issues becomes apparent early on. At several points, it can be very hard to figure out what you need to do in order to progress the game. In fact, I really wouldn't even recommend trying this game for very long without using a walkthrough. There are some English walkthroughs out there if you want to give it a shot. I doubt that even many Japanese players back in the day were able to play through this game without buying a guidebook. At least not without wasting a lot of their time. Here's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. There's a part early in the game where you lack the money to board the ship to the next continent since Atlas had all his money stolen by thieves in an earlier event. There is also no way to earn money since the enemies at this point give only experience. When Rando joins the party, he suggests that Atlas should sell his equipment, but if you go to any of the shops, it won't allow you to do so. So what do you think you have to do to progress the game? The answer is that you have to do a number of very specific things in a particular order in order to trigger a specific progression of conversations. First, you need to return to the port town where you couldn't get on the ship earlier. I'd already talked to the ticket seller here before, but talking to her again with Rando in your party triggers a conversation where Rando basically just reiterates that you need money. So what's the most obvious thing to do next? Go to the shop and try to sell your equipment again, right? Nope. Atlas refuses to sell his equipment to the shop. You actually need to go and talk to this random guy walking around the corner of the town, who tells you that the shop owner likes to collect rare old equipment. Ah, if only we had known this earlier! Back to the shop, and for some reason now Atlas reluctantly agrees to sell his equipment. The rest of this part finally follows a more logical series of events from here on, but there are several other parts throughout the game that are just as bad, or worse. And if you don't realize exactly who you need to talk to, you're going to end up going back to every town and talking to everyone again before you accidentally stumble on the solution. It certainly is a far cry from the current Legend of Heroes games where there is always an exclamation mark showing you where you need to go to progress the main story. When you get halfway around the world, you find out that monsters have started attacking everywhere, and now you have finally entered Chapter 1. This is where the battles become difficult as you try to make your way around the remainder of the world. And it hits you. Hey, this game is supposed to be a lot harder than the first. Not only is it often hard to figure out what to do next, it's super stingy with its gold and experience, necessitating a lot more grinding. Plus, the path between new towns is about to literally become labyrinthian. This game is clearly intended only for advanced players who cleared the first game and want more of a challenge. So let's continue to the end of chapter 1. Don't worry, I'll give ample warning before I talk about any big spoilers. After some initial struggling to make your party strong enough to make your way around, you eventually come to the end of the line. You've now covered the entire overworld of the first game. And what do you find? A new cave that wasn't there before. Enter and you get a short cave with no enemies and two strong guards at the end. If you manage to defeat them, you can move on to Chapter 2 and the Passage Beyond, leading deeper into the ground. What you find is a giant network of tunnels, almost impossible to navigate without a map. 
and within the tunnels you will discover underground towns, populated by people who have lived there all their lives and have never heard of the concept of above ground. If you make it this far, then congratulations, you have finally found the real game. What's this? Oh, this is the real party, Chris. That's right. The majority of new material in this game takes place here, underground. Good luck. The second game wasn't ported to as many different platforms as the first, but there are a few notable ports. The first port was of course to the PC-98, which was already Falcom's main platform by this time. This version was given the attention it needed, and it shows. The graphics were redrawn to fully take advantage of the PC-98's higher resolution, and even the full color palette this time. Some additional graphics were also added to the opening. Another huge improvement is that if you had a fancy device on your PC-98 called a hard drive, you could install the game instead of playing it directly from the floppies. The FM Towns port is basically a quick port of the PC-98 version again, released this time by the software company Brother, instead of Falcom themselves. No MSX version, no X68000 version, and no Windows version this time. The first console port was to the PC Engine in late 1992. It was ported very similarly to how the first game was. There is voice acting, and in my opinion, the soundtrack is some of Ryo Yonemitsu's best work. Unfortunately, Turbo Technologies in the US threw in the towel before they got around to releasing this game, so no English version was ever produced. I won't spend much time talking about the Super Famicom, Mega Drive, Saturn or PlayStation versions this time. They're all very similar to the respective ports of the first game, so if you've seen what I said about those ports in my previous video then you know basically what to expect here. There are no English patches available for any version, so unfortunately there is no way to play the game in English at this time. So what do I think of the game? It's a real shame that many people will never fully experience it. If not because of the language barrier, then maybe just because of the difficulty alone. Navigating the underground tunnels is challenging, and the grinding and ambiguity of what you need to do to progress the game can be a real bummer. In fact, I might even go as far as to say that any game that requires a guidebook is not a well-designed RPG. It's definitely not for the faint of heart, to say the least. Even if I had to use a walkthrough though, completing the game on the PC-88 did give me a real feeling of accomplishment. It's hard for me now to look back on the game and say that I didn't love it. I love the music, the characters and cutscenes are a huge improvement over the original, and the story eventually becomes genuinely interesting near the end. I think players of the first game will be really surprised to find out what secrets this world has been hiding all this time. The rest of this video is going to be spoilers, so watch at your own discretion. The first game made it clear at a few points that the world of Iselhasa is a post-apocalyptic one. One of the dungeons is a ruined skyscraper with electronic key cards for the doors, and there is a priestess you meet in the game who is able to enter the mysterious dome-shaped structures scattered about the world, which are known as dragon eggs. She says that inside the dragon egg she is able to pray to the goddess Freya and her servant Joshua, who sends her energy from the sky. All is revealed at the end of chapter 4 of the second game. It turns out that the advanced civilization that once inhabited the world wasn't wiped out. They just retreated underground two billion years ago, when their world was threatened by Agnija, the dragon from the end of the first game. Wait, that was what wiped out an advanced civilization? He wasn't even that hard to defeat. Anyway, in order to protect her people, the goddess Freya hid everyone underground and placed them in cryostasis, until only five or six generations ago, when they awakened from their slumber. Their scientists attempted to investigate the surface world, but were surprised to find humans already living there. They judged the surface dwellers to be hostile, and decided that attempting to communicate with them would only result in conflict. So the five masters, the wise men of their society, decided that they should remain underground for the time being, and erased the memories of everyone else living there. Yeah, erasing everyone's memories without their consent is totally not messed up at all, oh wise leaders. 
Unfortunately, an evil emperor called Godwin II has since taken control of the goddess Freya in order to create monsters he uses as weapons. He now rules the underground world, and hopes to do the same with the surface world next. He is the end boss of the game, complete with a scary second phase due to the modifications he made to his body using the power of the goddess. The goddess Freya, as you may have guessed, is actually a machine who was originally created to protect humanity. She has a humanoid form and personality, designed to prevent her from becoming evil, but the Emperor disabled that part of her design in order to utilize her for his own needs. The goddess's servant, Joshua, is a satellite which has been orbiting the planet all this time. I actually didn't mention the items in both the first and second games called the Eye of Joshua and Mirror of Joshua. These allow you to quickly see your surrounding area as you explore and are extremely useful. The five masters explain that the images displayed by these items are satellite images sent by Joshua. So it was a GPS all along. Neat. An unrelated spoiler that you may also be wondering about is the identity of Cindy. Well, he's the dragon that you rode on in the first game. And as a child, I built C-3PO. Huh? Yeah. Since he's somehow taken human form for most of the game, I kind of wonder why he thought he needed a mask. Wait a second. Oh. Cindy helps you defeat the Emperor while in his dragon form, and peace returns to the world, both above and below ground. The ground dwellers can finally emerge out into the sunlight, and a new age of advanced technology and cooperation is ushered in. Freya, having returned to normal, decides that she is no longer needed, and will leave humanity to decide their own fate hereafter as she enters a long slumber. We say goodbye to the world of Isel Hasa as Joshua continues to silently gaze down from above. So that's it for Dragon Slayer The Legend of Heroes 2. I hope you found that interesting and educational. Next time I'll be looking at something different. Until then, this has been Mr. Jakes from Basement Brothers. <laughs>